today is uh, June 27, 2017. Mm -hmm. We're at the Computer History Museum interviewing Greg van Vigoren. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Gunter Steinbach. Um, I contacted you because you have patents for the laser mouse, mm -hmm. but this interview is about uh, your whole oral history, your whole life and career, so to speak. Sure. And thank you very much to agree to the interview. Honored to be asked. <laughs> so let's start uh, with your background. Where did you grow up? Was, what was your family background like, uh, your hobbies? I, I grew up all over the country because <laughs> my father was in the US Air Force. And so our family, every well, when I was younger, every few months it seemed. But as I got older, every couple, three years, we'd move to a new place. <laughs> new part of the country. So I moved, lived many different places. So <clears throat> yeah, I, I lived in many different places. I was born in Texas, lived there for a month. Uh, <laughs> my father was, I think, stationed at an army base there that closed shortly after we left. And then I lived in uh, Alabama and Illinois and Ohio and Florida and Georgia. And actually, no, I didn't live in Georgia until graduate school, but uh, Washington State. Um, New York, New Mexico, maybe some other places I forget. <laughs> <laughs> so did you get a chance to develop hobbies with all this moving? Well, I was uh, just a child, so I did lots of child, uh, childlike things. Less connected to my career, I'm sure. But yeah, I played uh, sports with kids in the neighborhood. One of the nice aspects of growing up uh, on Air Force bases mostly is that mm -hmm. everybody on the Air Force base is uh, child rearing age and uh, usually different ranks of uh, men mostly there uh, lived in the same the same same rank would live in the same housing area which would have the same age children mm -hmm. so I uh, played a lot of baseball and football and basketball uh, for hobbies when I was younger uh, maybe a little bit of insight into my future career though I was really intrigued by uh, scientific things and notions about uh, infinity uh, and uh, astronomy and things like that when I was younger. Uh, and so that, uh, that kind of grew uh, over, over time as I got older and uh, decided to study that formally. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed uh, that you actually studied physics, not engineering, like uh, oh. probably most, <laughs> yes. most agile people, I don't know. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So I, I did study physics uh, in college and uh, in graduate school again probably because of my interest in in physics growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some inspiring uh, uh, points in my life that helped me in that path. First of all I enjoyed watching uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos on TV when I was a kid. My parents encouraged that and then uh, when I was in I think either the summer after sixth grade or the summer after seventh grade I went to or maybe even summer yeah summer after seventh grade uh, perhaps I went to a summer school where um, it was just enrichment activities, but one, uh, one of my classes was uh, taught by a particle physicist about <laughs> particles. And I, of course, had no mathematical capability, but found the whole topic fascinating of you know, colliding atoms together and protons and all this sort of thing. And uh, then another of my uh, classes that summer was on the uh, environment, but they had the part of uh, the class was uh, to get to see uh, an electron microscope in use. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool too. So those, that was a key point of inspiration for my later career. Uh, how did you choose the colleges you went to? Uh, I, I don't, uh, okay, <clears throat> I guess I did choose. I uh, had read about uh, Caltech, I think, uh, growing up. You know, I guess Richard Feynman was there, his famous physics school. Oh, I'd watched a Mechanical Universe TV show on PBS growing up, so and there was a professor who started each, uh, each program with a lecture from Caltech. Mm -hmm. Heard about MIT, <clears throat> so I applied to those two schools. Also Georgia Tech, because I was living when I graduated from high school in Florida, mm -hmm. uh, just south of, uh, in the Panhandle, uh, just, just beneath uh, Alabama and Georgia, and so Georgia Tech was nearby, and I had gotten a tour there potential scholarship, so I applied there. <clears throat> and also the University of Illinois, because my parents were state residents of Illinois. Mm. Because when you're in the military, you move around a lot, you're allowed to uh, 
have some flexibility in your state residence. And they had both uh, spent a lot of their time growing up uh, in Illinois and uh, maintained their residency. I actually lived there six years of my life and visited grandparents regularly. So I applied to the University of Illinois and I got into all those schools and I uh, was accepted to all those schools. And I, I don't remember what my first choices were, but I remember my last one was the University of Illinois. But I had received a scholarship there, so my parents told me that's where I was going. <laughs> so that's how I was, how, and in how state I chose my university. Course, too, oh, yeah, right? Well, yes, yeah. well, actually my scholarship was to waive the tuition. Mm -hmm. My parents still paid room and board, which was, I'm grateful to them for that. But that, so, uh, yeah, how did I choose? Well, it wasn't so much me choosing. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I could have chosen to go to the other ones and uh, take on student debt or something like that, but yeah. uh, the alternative path of uh, was uh, okay. Yeah. And later I discovered the University of Illinois uh, was perfectly fine school, allowed me to reach whatever potential. Yeah, it's a good school. Yeah, yeah, so I have no complaints. But at the time I wasn't very familiar with it. Yeah. But for, uh, for grad school you went to Georgia. Georgia Tech? Yeah, uh, again, uh, that, interestingly, I had, uh, I got married to my wife two weeks after graduating from undergraduate uh, with, a, with a bachelor's degree. So we had tried to plan to go to graduate school in the same area, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. And uh, anyway, the, uh, one of the schools where that was possible was uh, at Georgia Tech because my wife was accepted to Emory for law school also. Mm -hmm. So that, that made a nice uh, situation for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what about after you got your PhD? Was uh, did you go to Agilent right away? Well, I uh, <coughs> I stuck around and did some postdoctoral work for uh, I don't know I guess about six months mm -hmm. for uh, an electrical engineering professor there, um, Thomas Gaylord, a uh, man I respect. Quite a bit, and uh, but while working for him, though I was looking for outside uh, employment, um, either at a government laboratory or an industry, I had uh, decided I didn't want to be a professor. So, so anyway, my first uh, first professional job after that postdoc was with Agilent. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Which was Agilent already at that time? It it was. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. In about two thousand or so, right? I okay. joined se September first of two thousand. Yeah. Okay, and uh, how did you choose Agilent, Agilent over, okay. over others? Um, well, as much as I like physics, I also like building things and making things. And I had seen that a lot of the professor's time at Georgia Tech was spent uh, trying to write grant proposals, and this seemed less interesting to me. So, <laughs> So I thought it may be an industry you'd have a chance to have an impact on the world. People could use the things that mm -hmm. you designed or built. Or, and uh, in, in a government laboratory as well, there, there might be some uh, more hands-on research that I could do. Mm -hmm. uh, I did graduate with uh, expertise in chaos theory. So that, that uh, narrowed my choices, I think, uh, also. <laughs> so is that, that would be considered theoretical physics? Uh, I actually did experimental chaos. Theory. Oh, okay. And that, that's indeed how I uh, was hired at Agilent. I had developed for my thesis work a ring laser that was chaotic, and hmm. so I could demonstrate uh, communicating with this laser, uh, chaotic laser. So chaotic in the sense of jumping between modes? Uh, it had a, uh, well, chaos uh, has a, a certain technical definition for a mid right. uh, complex theory, so in, in that sort of sense. It was evolving in a way that was uh, difficult to predict ahead of mm -hmm. time, but followed some dynamics that uh, you could understand. So, so it wasn't random. Yeah, I know there are attractors and things. Yeah, yeah right. right, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so... But yeah, so my laser work actually was what opened the door to some of the right. uh, positions that I could consider in industry. Yeah. Would would you actually use the the chaotic uh, property yeah. as a as an advantage for communication? Yes, we thought of it. Uh, thought it might be helpful for encryption. Ah. Uh, the the analogy is that with a traditional radio, you know, you modulate a uh, carrier, and then you have on the receive side, you have a local oscillator that uh, 
is provided and you can demodulate. And with, with chaos, uh, chaotic communication, you have a chaotic carrier, but you could also synchronize. This is one of the properties of, of a chaotic system. Sometimes you can couple them together and synchronize mm. their behavior and then use uh, synchronized chaotic oscillators for de to demodulate uh, whatever was okay. modulated. So. so that was fun. <laughs> uh, Sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so Agile entitled you for your laser experience. That's pretty much correct. Yeah. And uh, I think they were desperate. <laughs> <laughs> it was the uh, telecom bubble at the time when I was hired. Yes, 2000. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, what, what was the first project that uh, you were put on? Uh, heterodyne optical network analysis. Okay. So it was fiber optic uh, test and measurement in general. So I was going to be uh, using a swept laser to basically characterize uh, the linear optical properties of a device. Bas uh, another way to say that you, we could get the Jones matrix that represents uh, Oh, the the amplitude and phase and polarization of mm -hmm. this device at right. each frequency. Yeah. So linear properties. Linear properties, yeah. And you got several patents, I saw, oh, yeah. in that field. Yes. And so heterodyne meaning you have a local oscillator that you, well. Yes. I guess if you, what if you are looking at a passive device? Well, that's what we were doing. We'd look at passive devices. It was for a passive component test, in a way. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we would uh, send a laser beam, a swept laser beam. Uh, so its uh, frequency was changing over time. Yeah, hopefully linearly. It wasn't really linearly. We had to calibrate that out. Uh, and then you uh, took a delayed version of that signal and mixed it uh, in, in, in fiber with the signal that had come either through the device or reflected from the device. And then now you had two beams at slightly offset frequencies because this is a swept laser right. and one's delayed relative to the other and so they're at slightly different frequencies and you can beat them uh, to, a low freq you know, to a low frequency on a photodiode. Okay. So it's a, okay. a lot of analog uh, analogous behavior toward, toward mixing and... And, uh, and you have to be careful that... Uh, heterodyne mixing. The difference stays constant, I assume. Yes, and it, it doesn't stay constant. <laughs> but we calibrated that out. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, did did that go into an instrument, or is is it uh, then yeah, that's that the uh, that's fun to talk the about. bubble burst? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, the bubble did burst about the time we were having some good success. We developed a method to completely characterize a device with one sweep of the tunable laser. Mm -hmm. Very clever, and uh, we were able to calibrate all all sorts of things out so that we got a ne nearly ideal. Uh, measure of the device. Um, unfortunately, uh, we did work with a division in Germany, and other than some advice about, well, you should use faster photo receivers or something like this, not much of what I had developed actually was incorporated into the system that uh, Agilent was selling, hmm. uh, or began to sell about that time, just as bubbles started to crash, uh, to pop. Um, they had plans to evolve it and accept some of our technology, but uh, then the bubble really did crash, and um, that that uh, put an end to that. Uh, well, my research project in that area and that product was discontinued. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, there was a competitor doing a similar thing, <coughs> uh, and that they still exist and still sell this product. Mm -hmm. but we do not. That? Uh, Luna. No. I forget the name, but Luna. Uh, maybe it's like Luna Technologies, I forget. <laughs> Something like this, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we, we did have the fundamental, yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. Did Ashland ever reprice that uh, that product? No. No? Oh. Does not, yeah, we haven't, we never. So, so they're not in the optical network analyzer business We're at not. all anymore? We're not, yes. Huh. Yeah, Gunter, you may remember that our, because uh, you worked there, our uh, light wave business and our optical test business uh, shrunk dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. But so you could think that in the meantime it yeah. has uh, revived. It has revived, yeah. But it's still not to the same yeah. number of people or same, uh, they can't support the same number of instruments anymore, I guess. 
Yeah, those were heady days with the stock at 160, right? Yeah. <laughs> For a, <laughs> yes. a brief blip. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's funny, you found those options. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that. I can remember the first day I was hired. Uh, oh no, I can't remember. I forgot his name. Anyway, the lab, uh, the communications and optics research laboratory, Wagi Ishak, mm -hmm. came by my desk and he handed me my signing bonus stock options because they gave those out at that time. He had to, to hire people, I guess. And he said, oh, look, $47. That's a great, great deal for you. <laughs> stock options at 47 <laughs> Never saw 47 again. <laughs> yeah, I think mine were at 80. Yeah, you were at yours. <laughs> we're at 80, huh? And we had one guy uh, <coughs> display it on his uh, on his book bookshelf uh -huh. in a beaker of water to show that it's <laughs> underwater. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So you were you were there at the beginning then? Yeah, I was. Uh, I was there. I, I rejoined just before they announced the split from HP. Okay. Anyway, so that died, mm -hmm. and then what did you do? Oh, uh, it seemed a very powerful technology, I thought, and my boss also felt the same way. So we tried to find other applications for it. It would be the easiest thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Besides light wave test measurement, is there any biology or chemistry that you can do with it? And um, Oh, oh, so we did look at that. That's right. But, but really, the next thing we ended up doing was, uh, well, not me, per yeah, so I, I, was, uh, I was part of this. Uh, I was with uh, two other f researchers, Mark Depew and Tong Shi and myself, trying to figure out uh, other uh, research that would make sense for us to explore. And while we were doing that, uh, Semiconductor Products Group representative, uh, Jack Wenstrand, came mm -hmm. and uh, told us that uh, Agilent really needed a new mouse, optical mouse technology. Oh, that was right then. Okay. That was right then, yeah. <laughs> and um, that did seem like it was impactful, so we started to do research about uh, how can we make a better optical mouse. I don't know if it's a better mousetrap, but a better optical mouse. So that, that was uh, what followed. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what did you suggest, and how was it better? <laughs> Well, the, the context was, I, if I remember right, uh, Ad, Agilent and HP had both had rights to the mouse patent, and HP sold theirs to Microsoft, mm -hmm. I think, something like this, and uh, <laughs> Microsoft began selling competing products uh, against Agilent, and so we felt we wanted some differentiation. Could we make a better mouse? Because there were some surfaces the mice didn't work on. Yeah. And uh, so we explored a number of different ideas. I can't remember all of them. Um, I, I do remember that I was working on one, it was uh, based on laser Doppler velocimetry, where you get feedback into a laser as it uh, moves and uh, it, it creates a modulation that you can detect. So I, I think mm -hmm. the frequency of modulation tells you how fast you're moving or something like this. And, and that would be a good way of making the, uh, a new mouse technology, I thought. Turned out I think it was relatively complicated. Um, but it was something I started to look at. And around that time, uh, Mark and Tong were looking at a different technology that I don't recall, but it also was uh, not working so well. So we were sitting uh, around a table some, one day wondering what we could do, and uh, I remember telling, uh, telling them both, you know, it seems like we need the light that comes off the surface to interfere with itself. Maybe that would give us some, some ability to uh, track changes. And uh, Tong said, you mean like a Daman grating? And I didn't know what a Daman grating was. But uh, anyway, uh, he and, uh, and Mark went off and uh, developed a, a Daman grating technique to do that. And uh, it worked, uh, <coughs> worked pretty well. Uh, ultimately, they ended up not even doing that, but finding a related technique where they didn't need any gratings and just used uh, coherent light with a laser on the surface. And, uh, I think that's the technology that went forward. I didn't really participate in the development, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that but you had the, the first idea of... Uh, uh, it, yeah, anyway, what, whatever it was, my comment uh, maybe got them started on it, yeah. So it, uh, does, it, does it then work very similar to the 
LED mouse in that uh, it just sees roughness or does it make speckles that that move in different ways? Um, you know, uh, maybe I should have read up on this before I, I came. <laughs> <laughs> my, my impression is that it is similar. When, when you had this laser, you did something with the laser to make it, uh, well, I will not be able to remember the details, I'm so, sorry, but somehow they are creating surface contrast. Even on relatively flat and shiny or so smooth surfaces, there's still enough contrast using the, the coherence properties of this laser mm -hmm. that they can track changes in motion. Okay. <clears throat> so it's very similar that way. Okay. We did have other ideas. I think you did see a patent on speckle. I looked at it more carefully after you <laughs> talked to me. I guess we didn't move forward with that one, but that was one option. We did study speckle now that you mentioned it. I forgot about that. Yeah, I was wondering about it because speckle, I think, isn't so correlated. Like you yeah. move in this direction, the speckle doesn't really necessarily yeah. move in the same way. I uh, can't recall why we dropped it, but. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, but, uh, but the mouse did work better. Yes, it, it did. It has been a commercial success. I would okay. Say. Yeah. Does it? Uh, does the laser also <coughs> use less power than an LED, or is that not? Oh, I don't know. I, I do not know. Okay. The power. Because yeah. I have one wild mouse, which I think is LED, and one wireless mouse, which is a laser, laser I believe. And I wonder whether I maybe wonder the too, laser yeah. needs Lasers less can, power. can be maybe more efficient. You can put all the light in the direction yeah. you want to look instead of an LED, which is sort of omnidirectional. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know what the trade-offs would be exactly. OK, but of yeah. course, the mouse did not remain an Agilent that's product right. very long. Yes. <laughs> because. <laughs> Uh, I think we, yeah, oh, that's right, yeah. So, yes, the mouse uh, was not an Agilent product very long because the company uh, took its uh, semiconductor products group and I think sold it uh, to uh, some other purchasers um, that then created a company called Avago. Mm -hmm. uh, and coincidentally, I think just a couple months ago, Avago uh, purchased Broadcom and changed their name to Broadcom. Right, yeah. yeah. So and that's been a very successful company as well. Do you, <coughs> do you know whether they still sell ma mouse chips? Uh, I think I I hesitate to say that I know that they do, but I believe they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what did you go on to do? Ah. So after that, uh, again wondering how to take what I knew and use it usefully in the company for Agilent and. Um, uh, I, I met uh, a sort of a senior researcher in the life sciences organization who told me that uh, Agilent really would like to develop uh, a biosensor for proteomics. There was a big who opportunity was that? there. Uh, Daniel Reutemann. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'll recall him, but uh, he was quite a character. Also, I recall the name. Hero of mine. But, uh, anyways, we, we need a proteomics biosensor. Some people do it using surface plasmons. And I wondered, well, uh, you know, how, do, how are they making these measurements? And I started reading some papers and I thought, well, I bet we could make measurements better <laughs> using this uh, technique that I had developed for the, the uh, um, optical component characterization. Mm -hmm. So I would interrogate the uh, biosensor with, with a heterodyne approach, was the thought. And there, there may have been some potential there, um, but. Uh, we event, you learn things and we figured out, well, we didn't need to do it that way, there are other ways, and we ended up creating a very nice um, technology in that space, I think. And that, that's been licensed now to some other company. Okay. <coughs> but Agilent does not uh, itself use it? Uh, much to my dismay, no, we did not. Uh, there was a difficult, uh, in fact, we had an eager uh, division at the time of Agilent wanting to get this technology and we're talking about all the plans they had for it. But they had, uh, they were pushing the envelope in the life sciences doing new things and uh, at the time, um, 2000, gosh, it would have been, uh, 
a seven, eight, something like this. Um, I think Agilent was trying very hard to get its return on invested capital up. We had a CFO and this sort of thing, and this division had not made a profit in a couple of years or something like this, and they were told, uh, you know, well, but anyway, they were the, the division was uh, eliminated, hmm. the one that was going to take our technology. So anyway, at that point, we ended up licensing. Yeah. <coughs> As an aside question, what are Surface Plasmons? Oh, great question. Uh, they are uh, uh, they are a solution to Maxwell's equation that sort of, to me, a combination of electrons and optical waves. But I guess they really are what what they are. Uh, I think that you might also hear them as a plasmon polariton wave. Uh, the idea, that the way we use them in the sensor is you illuminate a thin metal film with uh, light. <coughs> Maybe the film is thin enough that uh, it doesn't absorb all the light. It's just a, a very thin film. But uh, the free electrons in the metal uh, will oscillate as they're driven by the oscillating electric field mm -hmm. of the light wave. And uh, if you do that, um, at the right, uh, f well, if you m phase and phase and um, frequency match, I guess the uh, the light and the the electron wave, you can get a propagating wave that's sort of uh, a mixture of the two because the electrons oscillating on the surface create a traveling polariton wave because they're they're radiating as well as, as they mm -hmm. oscillate. So you end up with this coupled wave between the electrons and the polariton that propagates only in the near field on the surface mm -hmm. in, a, in a reactive zone. So that was uh, pretty interesting too. Oh, and okay. then if you have some goop on top, it changes. That's so. exactly right. Yeah, so okay. we would put some goop on the uh, metal film and uh, <coughs> maybe attach uh, certain biomolecules and then flow through some fluid uh, other biomolecules and if they interacted it would change the uh, refractive index of the goop on the surface and uh, this is all happening at microscopic scales but it uh, a lot but this surface wave uh, surface plasma wave allowed you to uh, detect really minute uh, changes in that refractive index yeah. on the order of like 10 to the minus 7 hmm. uh, refractive index units so okay it allowed you to see microscopic things with a beam of light interrogating the sensor. So. Does it react fast? Oh, uh, well, there is a limit to how quickly you can flow uh, a fluid with you know, dissolved molecules in it across the surface. So we, you'd want uh, your sensor to be relatively small and have a small volume so that it would happen pretty quickly. Uh, and you have to have the chemical reactions happen. So they, they have their own uh, kinetics, they call it, I guess, is the rate at which the molecules bind or, or dissociate. And some of those can be very slow. So even if you get the fluid there quickly, uh, it can still take uh, you know minutes for mm -hmm. some of these molecules to build up on the surface. And you can watch the process happen, uh, mm -hmm. the surface binding. But uh, yeah, we tried to make it so it was uh, like a tenth of a second to to wash through the cavity of the, the the fluid cavity for the sensor, so that it, it, you could see reactions on that that order of time. But you would have to somehow calibrate, I assume, to the response of the of the light to what was actually happening chemically, right? It, yes, it yes, indeed. Clear yeah. From well, we're right. sensing refractive index changes. So, as I recall. Uh, I went to the cafeteria and borrowed some sugar and made uh, some sugar solutions of different uh, um, concentrations. And this is, <laughs> apparently you can buy such things, but uh, I was in a hurry. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we did, we, we calibrated the system over some orders of magnitude uh, okay. of, of concentration. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell the cafeteria. <laughs> There was okay, the cond so condiments, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so what then? Oh, uh, OK, so that was surface plasmon resonances. Uh, that, that was a great product. I was very proud of that. Um, disappointed when it sort of fell through from an Agilent perspective. Uh, after that, now I, I had expertise in measuring th surfaces, mm -hmm. uh, changes of refractive index on 
on metal and I thought maybe I could measure uh, electric fields. If I put some sort of electro-optic type substance on this film, the, the gold film, it would respond to electric fields and change refractive index and I could image. By the way, uh, our solution ended up ha uh, for the surface plasma resonance sensor allowed multiplexing by having a camera that looked at the surface. Mm -hmm. This was a breakthrough at the time because cameras weren't thought to have enough sensitivity. And in fact, even the camera I chose didn't have high sensitivity, but it was fast and I could average a lot. Mm -hmm. and, I could, and we also figured out how to use laser light instead of LED light so we could get a lot brighter illumination of the surface. Mm -hmm. And that combination allowed us to have uh, basically an imaging sensor. Well, if I could do that, maybe I can uh, measure electric fields um, on surfaces of things using, you know, a, a surface plasmon resonance sensor. And we thought maybe we could apply it to flat panel display test because there are a lot of, uh, th you know, thin, well, they have thin film transistor arrays, and sometimes the uh, transistors fail, and you need to be able to. Uh, see those and make sure that there aren't too many. And one way I, we could have imagined to do that is to pass this sensor over the surface and, uh, and look for where there was a gap in the electric field. Mm -hmm. It should have been a field of a certain value and there wasn't. So anyway, that was one thought. And I visited uh, the Hachioji site in Japan to talk about that. But before I got very far on that, I was in the lab uh, talking to uh, an institution of the labs, uh, Rory Van Tile. And uh, we had both visited Santa Rosa and heard some of their experts tell us about the challenges of making better network analyzers. And so that, that was the next project, actually. So I kind of almost got started with the, the surface plasma resonance sensor for flat panel displays. But before I did, I ended up transitioning to a different project that came about because of a conversation. Shall I just keep talking, or did you? Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, Yes, we had heard one of the challenges was how do you keep these uh, two um, synthesizers, they need a network analyzer, one RF uh, stimulus and one local oscillator, how do you keep them offset and still sweep them fast? Um, that was a challenge. <clears throat> so I went back and I was thinking to myself about my days in graduate school and how I had uh, been using a ring laser and it had a comb spectrum. If you, if you looked at it on a spectrum analyzer, you'd see all these uh, combs. I thought, well, I wonder if you had a, a comb of frequencies. You wouldn't have to synchronize two synthesizers and step them as quick as you can over this whole space and, and have to wait for, the, wait for them to settle um, and slow your sweep down. You just have all the tones simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So I suggested that to Rory, and Rory said, oh, well, we could use a pseudo-random bit sequence to do that. But you have caps. What's that? You have gaps between the uh, UF tones. You do have gaps, yes. Yes. But even in a network analyzer, I guess in the old ones they wouldn't be swept, but uh, most modern network analyzers are stepped now. Mm -hmm. So they sort of have gaps in that way too. Okay. Right? And that was the start of the uh, digital network analyzer project. Yeah. That one, that one's sort of proprietary. Now okay. that I think about it. <laughs> There, there you is do have some patents. I do have patents on this, yeah, so some of it's published, yeah. Yeah, so some of it's published, what should I say? I guess I can talk about it in general in terms then. Even though it's published, I, I think we're asked not to okay. talk about it very much. Oh, that's fine. It's a, another, another but source But the basic of idea is irritation, yeah. you have a, a source with, with a comb of frequencies. That's right, that's right. And then you, how do you get the IF though? We have you another. Have three, field, two comb, two? We have two combs, that's right. Okay. Yeah, and uh, some mathematics tells you uh, where, how you can uh, uh, design the two combs so that they will, that all the frequencies you care about will fall in an IF that's measurable by you with some relatively uh, inexpensive analog to digital converters at you know, low, low bandwidths and uh, make sure that these tones don't fall on top of each other because that's a problem, so we do all that. Um, and it turns out you can make very fast measurements that way. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, a challenge that uh, it, it ha uh, this technique would have, of course, is uh, non-linearities are an issue. 
when you uh, mix things in a mixer, you know, the mixer is not completely linear. Uh, and you, nor is it like amplifiers and so on. So you, if you have all these tones present simultaneously, and you, you're trying to make a network analyzer with 120 dB of dynamic range, you have to make sure they I don't. I was going to uh, ask you about this. Oh, you were, yeah. <laughs> 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 they, they don't uh, create uh, you know, spurious uh, mixing products. Mm -hmm. So we had a trick we played to uh, greatly uh, fix that, I would say. Uh, dynamic range, I think uh, it is nonlinear, so I think, in the, well, it depends on how much effort you put into the, your electronics, I would say. Yeah. We do have a, uh, well, darn it, okay, never mind. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so anyway, straightforward would be, you know, get 70 or 80 dB, I would say. Now, uh, is this uh, your current work, or are you on to something new now? On to something else. Okay. Yeah. Which you can talk about or not? <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, you want to know everything I, I do. Well, maybe it'd be interesting uh, to develop a, a portable version of that technology I told you about. So after the DNA project, there was another project or two to make it portable. And okay. About that time, uh, I was uh, uh, turn, uh, promoted to a manager in, in the research labs so I could lead that development. So anyway, now, uh, if you ask what am I doing, well, a lot of it's management. <laughs> and and uh, it's not one project, but I have really a lot of, a lot of fun in my, <laughs> my job because I work with a very diverse team. We have people who are photonic integrated circuit designers, and we have people who are millimeter wave experts, and other people who are DSP experts, and software experts, and FPGAs. And, a variety of projects uh, go on at any given time, so, so it's uh, hard to say exactly what I am doing personally at this time. And you still get uh, to do some technical work, or oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so you you help your people and you uh, yeah. So I, I have noticed that uh, <coughs> I did tend to work on that uh, follow-on projects of the DNA technically in addition to managing okay but uh, the group seems to be getting bigger and it gets harder to do <laughs> e even so maybe there's uh, one project that's particularly urgent or I have some skills uh, I'll, I'll sort of uh, try to add a little bit of uh, I think the uh, jargon is wood behind the arrow uh, myself uh, for example last couple of days I've had a couple of people doing urgent uh, simulations for some design uh, <coughs> of, of system we're developing and I didn't want to slow them down so when a uh, business partner asked us to make some measurements of our preliminary design w with our preliminary uh, tool uh, I did it myself mm. yeah. okay. so I didn't want to slow them down so. yeah. Um, yeah I think in labs uh, one of the nice things is even as a manager I, I feel like uh, uh, I still pretty deep have to be pretty deep technically and uh, be involved. I, I don't do a lot, and I, I don't always do all of the inventing and all that, uh, but I still contribute technically somehow, mm -hmm. it feels like. So that, that, that is a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned several projects that, like, well, were, went to other companies or well, didn't uh, mm -hmm. didn't uh, get pursued yes. inside. Yeah. Were you ever yeah. tempted to follow them elsewhere? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you resisted the temptation. Yeah, never, never reached the threshold. But I did think of it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah. So that that's pretty much. Uh, I don't know if I have any great deep thought processes on that. Part of me wondered. Well, is this is this the right technology to uh, stake a career on um, or make a career of? One of the nice things of working at Keysight Labs is that uh, it seems like there's always a new bit of technology to explore and derive. And mm -hmm. So I have not run out yet. I don't know what the new things will be, but uh, anyway, <laughs> one of the advantages is uh, I don't have to do just one thing. Right, yeah. yeah. 
Um, you have, I saw one uh, patent from, from your PhD work. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you comment on the difference between uh, Georgia Tech Research Lab and uh, mm -hmm. now Keysight uh, Labs? Sure, I think so. In, in terms of the technical work and yeah, the yeah. way you work. Yeah, I think so. Let's see. Um, if I go back to my thesis, obviously uh, I, I was less a mature researcher then, had less context. Um, so it's interesting to see now that I have a better, uh, broader view of the world, I would say. But as a, a th doing my thesis research, let's see. This was in chaos theory. Um, it had some practical applications that made it interesting. Um, I, what I should say is potential practical applications that made the research sort of interesting. Well, can you make it do this? Because that would be, that, that might be helpful someday. But I, I think that that research in the chaos theory uh, realm was relatively fundamental. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't particularly applied. We weren't, it wasn't expected that it be applied. It'd be great if it, if it could be. And so that's a, that's a difference. I think at Keysight, um, well, well, when I was in graduate school, interesting research, good science, uh, somebody's never done it before, that was all important. Same in Keysight Research Labs. But there's this additional hurdle of it has to make business sense also. And so in a way, I think as a, in academia, if, if you had money, you, you could be much more free about uh, what you wanted to study, what you wanted to spend your time doing. On the other hand, I like the um, discipline and the challenge of trying to do something that no one's ever done before in a research way uh, and have it make business sense. So it's, uh, it's like uh, increases the degree of difficulty. It's also satisfying when you succeed. Although you don't always know ahead of time yeah, you don't. whether it will make business sense, right? You do not know. You yeah. have to find that out. That's you part of it. You have to use your best judgment, yeah. yeah. And be able to communicate to uh, senior management uh, <laughs> why this is a good use of uh, your time or your team's time, yeah. Right. And, and, and budget and so on, yeah. At the end of the day, we have to, uh, have to show a return on investment. Interesting, in, interestingly at Labs, we uh, do not uh, feel that we have to be successful in all of our research. In fact, I think the, think, uh, the thinking, at least for my group, yours might be different. Uh, yours, your former uh, group might have had a different philosophy because there was so it, much at stake. Yeah, it was coupled pretty <coughs> tightly because it was so expensive yeah. to make a chip. But for my group, the idea was if, if we succeeded all the time, if all of our technologies worked out, then we weren't trying hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, if none of them work out, well, that's, a, that's another <laughs> issue too. So. You were also not trying hard <laughs> enough. <laughs> I think that's right. Either way, we're not trying hard enough. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so it's an deg extra degree of difficulty having to have a business uh, justification for the research now. And I guess you are the first, as, as the project manager, you're the first uh, instance of deciding will this work. And if you think you have to you have to propagate up the ladder, or yeah. how does it, uh, how would you say it works? Yeah, I think anybody on the team can come up with uh, ideas and concepts. Uh, if it's not me, though, they have to explain it to me and uh, point out why this is uh, important for, for the company and, mm -hmm. and how, how it would be done, what resources they would need, and then I'll communicate that upwards. And if it's uh, my own idea, well, I'll, I'll probably talk to experts in, in my team or in the company and mm -hmm. check that all my assumptions are right and do that, too. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess we are through Keysight, Agilent. Uh, okay. What do you do outside of work? Um, well, I have a, have a family that keeps me pretty busy. <laughs> I have two boys. Uh, if you wanted to go into hobbies, let's see. I like to play the piano. I don't get much time to do it because I have a small house and a loud piano, and the rest of the family uh, doesn't doesn't care for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see, uh, I also uh, am a member of a church, 
so that's a Sunday morning activity mostly. And um, I, for the last eight years, I was realizing ten seasons, I have been a uh, ma little league manager huh. for baseball. So that's another hobby of mine. So between those things, I think that keeps so me pretty your busy. Your kids are spaced apart to, uh, to well, keep I have, you in Little League. I only have two, two kids, yeah, but one of them is, uh, is about three years older than the other. So yeah, he, he started when he was five, and he, I was his coach till he was 10. And I swapped back to the younger kid and did him up till he's 11. So. Okay. Yeah. All right, anything else you want to uh, say? I, I don't think so. Okay, well, cover a you typical are researcher. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you're young enough that uh, you may well return here in another 10 years or so. <laughs> That'd be great, Gunter. Hope to see you again. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the interview. Oh, you're welcome.